My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hello there. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the podcast. My guest today is Darcy Loma. Darcy has served as the director, uh, um, director of United States Senator Herb Cole's office for 12 years before launching Darcy Loma Coaching and Consulting, where she and her team have worked with over 500 organizations and 48 industries to create high-performing people and teams by solving their people problems which all problems usually do go back to that, don't they? While Darcy has a double major in German and mathematics, wow, the only time she uses these skills is when trying to double a recipe for German black forest cake. She first discovered her love of coaching while doing her master's thesis at Pepperdine on the impact of coaching, which I want to ask you about. She is a master certified coach who designed the rigorous certified professional coaching program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and now serves as the director of training. She was honored to be voted Madison, Wisconsin's favorite coach four times in a row, which is very good. She is the 20, in her 23rd season of doing triathlons of every length, including a full Ironman. Her lifelong dream of being physically fit for the body created the spark for her model of being thoughtfully fit for the mind. She's the author of the book, Thoughtfully Fit, Your Training Plan for Life and Business Success, and is here today to help you be thoughtfully fit too. Darcy, thank you for taking some time to chat with me. I appreciate it. It's such a pleasure to be here, David. Thank you. Well, absolutely. Let's just go ahead and jump into it. Can you begin with your background experience? We know a little bit about your background based on the introduction, but how exactly did you transition into coaching from politics and why, and how did you come to differentiate yourself if, in fact, you did? Uh, yes, I was in politics for the majority of my career, and I went to the senator I was working for and said that I wanted to go back and get my master's and that I was going to resign. And he said, great, you can get your master's, but you can't resign. So, so figure it out. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? Well, I found this fantastic program through Pepperdine University where it was designed for working professionals, where I would go to a class in China, in France, in Mexico, in California uh, for a couple of weeks every quarter. And it was uh, considered a full-time program, even though, you know, we would just be in class for a couple of weeks every quarter. In that program, David, I had to do a master's thesis. And I went to my thesis advisor with my topic, which was, brace yourself, the ethical considerations of a gubernatorial transition team. And my thesis advisor looked at me and she said, so how passionate are you about this? And I was like, I'm passionate? What, what does that have to do with anything? I'm writing a thesis. And she said, well, you're going to be spending two years doing a deep dive. You, you definitely want to do something you're excited about. Yeah. That was the pivot to coaching. And that was the moment when I said, really, I can do it on whatever I want. And she said, yeah. So I chose to write about uh, coaching. I took 100 former U.S. Senate interns, randomly selected 10, coached them. That was the, the path that got me over in this other world uh, in coaching. Yeah, I really wanted to dig down a little bit into the thesis because I'm particularly interested in that. And 
when you looked at the efficacy of coaching, what criteria did you use? It, you know, was it the coaches have to be meet certain criteria and they have to work with certain types of people or business owners, right? Can you explain that just a little bit more? Absolutely. I did an action research project. And so I was the coach and I took a hundred former U.S. Senate interns, randomly selected 10. We gave all of them two pretests that I researched and found. Um, and then I coached the 10 people weekly for three months. And at the end, we gave a post, the same two post tests to, to everybody. I took all that data, sent it to a professor at U the University of Wisconsin-Madison and asked him to do all the, the analysis. And I, I will never forget the day he called me because he said, Darcy, th this is powerful. Like, I don't know what coaching is, but regardless of where the, the people started in the beginning uh, in terms of race, gender, what their degree was, what they were studying, what their level of self-awareness or their goals was, after three months of coaching, you can unequivocally say that they have greater life satisfaction, stronger goals, more self-awareness. You should publish this. That was my then, it was like the permission I needed to, to, to dig in further and to go and get certified as, as a coach and to start then a, a, well, a couple decades, I guess, process of training and becoming a master certified coach. So when we talk about coaching, I, I know you're aware of this, that there are so many magical gurus and everybody and their kid brother is a coach now. Um, I've done a little bit of coaching, but I make it very clear, hey, I'm not a professional coach. I, I do not ever represent myself as being one. I always say that whatever coaching I do is based on my own experience. That's it. Um, if you don't like it, that's okay. You know, I'm not for everybody. My approach is not all, you know, so how does your approach being, you know, considering your academic credentials and your professional experience and, and everything else, how does that differ from what you see in the majority of cases? How close does it come to cognitive therapy or where do the lines blur if you if you may yes there is a lot of misperceptions um out there on what what coaching is because as you rightfully stated anybody tomorrow could put up a website and declare i'm a coach the bar for entry is very low and the biggest misperceptions that i see is what coaching is so a lot of people will say i'm a coach and really, they are a mentor or a trainer or a consultant, right? right? That's, and and, and that's pretty much the approach that I would take. But then you see other coaches basically making these incredible claims and promises that are um, very, very difficult to meet for anyone. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's how you know. I mean, there's there's great value in hiring a, a, a consultant or working with a, a mentor or a therapist for that matter. But that is not coaching. In coaching, the client is the expert. If if in mentoring, if I'm mentoring you, David, I'm the expert. I've been there. I've done that. Let me give you some of my wisdom and advice. If you are my client in coaching you are the expert. I don't know what dreams and wishes and goals you have for the future. Mm. I don't know what your obstacles are that are getting in the way. I'm going to help you uncover that, create new awareness, and then identify your actions on how to move forward towards what you want. Now, when you were studying coaching, did they, and I'm, and I'm only asking because I really don't know, did they delve into different cognitive behavioral models and did they talk about the dsvm at all well, um only from the standpoint of getting really clear on the distinction and what's different from coaching to therapy 
and and to to really overly simplify it right now i mean we have i designed the the coaching the professional coaching program at uw madison we have an entire module 20 hours on ethics so i'm given just the, the a sliver with therapy the focus primarily is on looking at the past and healing and recovering from something that's happened to get to a functional life today with coaching the focus is not on the past the focus is on who you are today is innately capable creative and competent and you have a desire and a wish to be something in the future so the the focus is on mm, the future right. and in therapy it's not necessarily that the person is innately capable creative and competent in coaching that is a core belief in therapy there may be depression there may be uh, bipolar there may be ptsd there's a lot of other diagnoses that come into play that um don't in coaching right so in in, in coaching compared to counseling or therapy the the main point the onus is different so yeah and and i mean obviously with therapy i you can't help someone if you can't go back and say i need to know the origin i need to know what your childhood was like to know what you were programmed to be and then go out into the world and we can't know that unless we we delve into that so can you, know, you i'll just highlight that one isn't better than the other right I, i've had a lot of therapy and i've had a lot of coaching it's just as you said it's just a different lens through which you are looking at your your life so they're both really beneficial just different i remember going to therapy one time and this was a long time ago when i was in college and you know i didn't really know what direction i wanted to go in and i remember the psychologist at the time just was like he came over one time and he literally kicked the chair up and just said that's it get out that's it get out i've heard enough this oh my god you you know and i just said well i don't know how i feel about this therapy stuff he really doesn't have much of a sense of humor but and i'm being a little bit silly but it actually that was basically my experience with it but I think it can be beneficial. And I think obviously if the person that I had gone to see was better, it probably would have been a little bit of a better experience too. Well, that's interesting because when uh, I had, you know, pretty extreme tragedy in my life blew up five years ago. And after that, yeah. I was searching for a therapist and David, I had five therapy sessions with five different therapists that were bad that yeah. were not good now i knew i need therapy so i kept on going till i found the right fit right Most people have an experience like you where if they go and it's not it's either a bad therapist or it's not the right chemistry they think ah oh, this isn't for me and it's the same with coaching right the there, there, person that's the right fit yeah there's good and bad with everyone and with everything you do and uh one of the things i learned and i don't know if Honestly, I could always do this and I don't know if it's good for all situations, but I think in some situations it could be helpful is what they call in the South to come to Jesus talk. I, I, I had always had, uh, um, a, a long story short, I went to a dentist and I had to have a root canal and I was really nervous about it. And I went to him and he was a young guy, just graduated from dental school, young, good looking guy. Was, it looked like he could bench press Peoria. And he was in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Colorado, which is why I went to him. I mean, I'm just transparent about it. And I went to him and I said, I got to tell you, I've had horrible experiences with dentists. And, you know, I need to have this done. I'm in a lot of pain. I got to talk to you. I really need you to slow the F down and talk to me like I'm an adult. If you don't like me, it's okay. My wife thinks I'm funny. If, you know, if I get on your nerves, I apologize. I'm doing the best I can to be a good human being. If you need me to be still, I can be, I can play dead. I won't move. But you need to talk to me like I'm an adult. So if I ask you a question, please respond because I really don't know or I'm legitimately worried. Can you do that? And he actually took a second. He said, yeah, I can do that. And after that, he was the sweetest, nicest guy. 
and he's still there in Denver, Colorado. And I actually send him Christmas cards and he's a, the sweetest guy. But because of that talk, let me ask you about your book. And I give you credit because you asked for what you needed and you were able to have the courage to articulate. And it was hard. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's hard. That's a, that's a really challenging skill set. So I give you a lot of credit for being able to do that. Yeah, a lot of people like, a lot of people don't like conflict. Yes. It's, it's stressful. It takes your energy. If you're a big guy, you can't go around beating people up. You're going to end up in the penitentiary. And if you're not that type of personality, you just you just want a peaceful, quiet life. And it, it is. It's difficult to do. So I just did it in a, in a gentle way. Just say, hey, can I really talk to you for a minute? And, and and it did work. Now, when I, I actually I went to a general practitioner doctor, and which is redundant. But I went and I said the same thing to him. And I said, I need you to do this and, and all that. And he said, yeah, I can do that. And if I can't do it, I will send my nurse practitioner. So now whenever I go there, I don't see the doctor. I see the nurse practitioner because she can, she can tolerate me. And if something else needs to be done, she'll say, I'll, I'll ask the doctor, I'll send it out or whatever. And now they're in Sarasota, Florida. And again, she's the sweetest lady. If if I don't know something, I do tell a doc with her. And I just, I need to talk to you about something. I just have questions. Oh, okay. I don't care as long as the insurance will pay for it. So let's get back on you. The story that you share in your book about your husband's arrest, I really, we went over these questions beforehand for anybody listening or watching. And at first I didn't feel comfortable asking this. And I put a little note to myself to say, check with her. Does she really want me to ask this? Do we need to do this? There's my note. Okay. And you guys can't see this, but I do have paper here. If you want to talk about it, what happened? And then I'll get into how, how did you build from this? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm I'm um, happy to talk about it, and I can talk about it because of a lot of time in therapy where I have done my my work to be able to heal and recover from something that was very tragic. In March of 2016, I was um, married. I had started my full time business doing coaching and keynotes and consulting, all around creating high performing people and teams. I left politics and. My husband was a full-time uh, stay-at-home dad for our two young daughters. And um, the, the day before our 10-year wedding anniversary, actually, I got a phone call from a neighbor asking Darcy. She said, Darcy, what is going on at your house? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm not home. Why? And she said, there is a SWAT team. There's 40 or 50 police cars. They have guns. And they just took Don out handcuffed, barefoot. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I mean, that phone call, David, well, it was worse than any nightmare. I, I never had a nightmare that bad. The police arrested my husband for sexual assault of a minor he had met online. Okay. And he was put in jail. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry that happened to you. Podcast or no podcast, we're, we're still adults here doing this. I'm sorry that happened to you, okay? Thank you. Okay, first of all, any anybody who listens or watches this, this is extremely serious. It's, it's not a, a joke or a game. If anybody talks to you about anything like this, remotely like this, they need patience and they need a soft place to fall. So I'm sorry that happened to you, first of all, okay? So I'll let you continue as you see fit. If you want to take a minute, it's perfectly fine. I have water. I have plenty of stuff I can work on. Okay. If you want to take a minute, do you want me to pause? No, thank okay. you so much for the, the level of um, respect and deference for you have for, for the, the heaviness of, of this. It's very, very serious. Um, a lot of people can't talk about it. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. Um, and it's I, probably one of the reasons that I that I 
decided I did want to talk about it was because for people who have experienced something tragic um, where they have, maybe there's a lot of shame, maybe there's embarrassment, maybe there's fear. Yeah. Um, all of the above. Not all of the above. It's, it's, not, it's not talked about. And when I, so what's interesting, David, is five days before my husband's arrest, I had spent years researching this thoughtfully fit model where we were looking at, I've, I've coached thousands of clients, every level, uh, you know, frontline managers, directors, VP, C-suite, you name it. And I started to notice that every coaching client has like similar problems they bring into coaching. And I thought, am I, am I, is this right? Not different, different story, different details, but, but similar problems. So we spent a couple of years categories and, and researching what are the problems. And we came up with that there are six main obstacles that every client brings into coaching. So we finalized this model of Thoughtfully Fit with these six hurdles and on a Saturday in March. And it was five days later that my husband was arrested. And I had to hire, the, the, the charges were so severe. I had to hire my own attorney. I, my husband had a, a, a criminal defense attorney. I had to hire my own attorney. And my attorney said, Darcy, don't talk to anybody about anything. This is serious. And I yeah. became ground zero to test drive this thoughtfully fit model in my own life. Wow. And this was five years ago? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I don't know where to begin. I remember being a mediator for a while and mediating court cases. And for a very brief period of time, for like two years, I had a mediation nonprofit. But I wouldn't, I couldn't talk to people where their custody I could do but anything beyond custody, no. And the children don't get to be present. That was the, 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 the rules of that. Whether it was in a court building or just me, you know, in a conference room somewhere, the children aren't going to be there. You might want them to be there, but not if you're going to talk to me. I won't. Uh, no. Uh, so, I mean, what happened? You know, you're still healing from this. Yes. Um, he was, he was arrested. Okay, and, good, um, good. <laughs> yep. And uh, what happened, uh, my, my daughters had never gone a day without their dad in their lives. He did all the grocery shopping, the cooking, the Girl Scout cookies, the haircuts, the right taxi driver. Um, he, when he went away that, that day, it was March 17th of, uh, he never came back. Right. He was ultimately convicted, um, to, oh, yeah. to a 10 year prison sentence. Yeah. If a SWAT team comes and takes you out, it's pretty serious because they're not going to do that. Normally you would be issued your citation or you would, you know, you'd get a letter to report or, or something like that, but they're not a SWAT team. The SWAT team is there because they want to make sure you don't get away. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty serious. And I mean, on multiple levels, that impacts you and your entire family on multiple levels from trust. And I know that this is about your coaching, but it's going to... I'm sure it's impacted your coaching. So you have to own it, even though it really had nothing to do with you. You just happened to walk into it. Basically, you know, it's like a car accident. You didn't ask for it. You didn't do anything. It just occurred to you. You happened to be there the wrong place at the wrong time. That's what you have to recognize. And I'm sure you told yourself that, you know, so and I mean. Absolutely. And I would say that, hmm, the majority of my clients that come into coaching, and, and I'm guessing you have friends and neighbors and clients that you deal with, when bad things happen, it, it oftentimes is out of the blue, right? All of a sudden, there's yeah. a cancer diagnosis, there's an accident, there is a layoff, there is a conflict, and it's you, you, you don't wish for it, you don't want it, and, and there you are at, at, at the center of this crisis. And 
ironically, Thoughtfully Fit, the, the model that I was developing for years was all about how do you handle yourself thoughtfully in any and every situation so that you can get back to doing what you do best instead of, you know, something bad happens and you don't handle yourself thoughtfully. You're on autopilot. You have a knee jerk reaction and it makes things worse. And now not only do you have the problem, whatever the emotion. happened, yeah. you've got now the issues that have, are, are piled on top of it because you overreacted, you yelled, you whatever it might be, that made things worse. So what I'm hearing so far is that thoughtfully fit sounds to me, and I'm a little bit biased, sounds Buddhist. So just how did it help you? through this and I mean there's the physically fit aspect and then there's the thoughtfully fit which I'm guessing is similar to mindfulness yes there's there's a lot of elements of, of, of mindfulness in, in in it and how how did it help me so you just mentioned physically fit if, if you want to be physically fit you, you need to train and practice pretty consistently you know you don't just do 20 sit-ups once a month and say i'm done in the same way if you want to be thoughtfully fit you have to train and practice i happen to have made this my life's mission to figure out how to how how, how to have a, a um you know strong leadership skills emotional intelligence team building appreciative inquiry all of all of that and so when this happened Thankfully, I had been working really hard on not only studying and researching it, but developing the model and helping my clients that I was able in that moment to pause. And instead of overreacting and making things worse, to, to just pause and think. And a lot of times when um, things are happening fast, if we don't pause and think, we just act. And it's a default, right? Very true. And, very true. Yeah. yeah. So that's the core of the model, three steps, pause, think, act. And so I, I mean, there mm. were times, David, where I had to tell myself, Darcy, you have to pause. Don't reply to that email. Don't right? pause. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is I remember when I was growing up, I spent a lot of time around these military bases because my dad was in the Navy for like 30, 35 years. And so I would talk to military people, you know, because they're everywhere you go. You know, if you grow up around bases, it's just natural. And I found that when you could get past a lot of the, ma the macho posturing and everything, a lot of them that I would talk to, they would say, well, you know, what are the rules for survival that they drill into your head? And I remember asking. And one of the guys told me, he said, the first thing is you don't know what is going on. You don't have a real full assessment of what the threat or the danger is to you. So the first thing you do is protect yourself and find shelter. Then after you find shelter, you 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 re, you reassess the, what's going on. You basically protect yourself, get away, pause for however long you need to reconstitute you know what you need and then come up with a plan for coming back so it's similar somewhat in that it is and, and i'll give you two specific examples where your your story it's very similar one um i i hired a crisis communications firm because my whole job is based on my reputation. And all of a sudden, I'm my husband is on nightly news and social media. Um, and this wasn't a story that just had a, you know, 72 hour news cycle, and it was gone. It was months and months, because there were multiple suspects, multiple victims. And so my crisis communicator, she said, Darcy, you need to take a couple months off work. For yourself, if nothing else. Yeah. And but it's interesting, David, because I my instinct was completely opposite. I was like, I need to I need to work. I've got more bills um, than I've ever had with a divorce attorney, a crisis yeah. communicator, right? A criminal defense attorney, therapist, uh, um, and that in that moment, I, I completely disagreed with. But I, I told her, I said, Lori, I I, I don't agree. 
I don't understand, but I'm, I'm paying you to advise me and I'm not thinking straight. So I'm going to do that. That was a huge pause that I needed that yeah. I didn't even know that I needed to protect myself, to give myself that time to be able to triage everything that was happening. That's exactly it, because you're still healing. So you can't take someone who's healing and then put them out on a battlefield. And you can't solve a problem when you're obsessing over it, whether you do it consciously or unconsciously. I mean, that, that's why so many Buddhist monks, you know, go and they spend hours just sweeping up leaves or something. And you're like, why are they doing this silly busy work? Well, it's so they can get out of their own heads and then sit down and try to think about things that are more deep and more meaningful to them or in their lives. A lot of people who are going through PTSD or trauma go and become monks. Yeah. Because, because you know, they, they need help dealing with it. Yeah. You and, know, and for me to, to stay in busy, productive mode was almost like a way to numb out and not even deal with it. And it is. It forced me to pause to deal with it. The, the second thing that, that I did when you said, you know, you have to protect yourself and pause, I, I um, the, the, the news, I mean, there was a bank of news trucks out in front of my house and, yeah. and media and my daughters were eight and nine. And I made the very difficult decision to move them to Minnesota to live with my sister in an, another state five hours away to protect them so that they could be kids and they wouldn't have to deal with um, this barrage of intense media and conflict and their mom, uh, you know, at the center of the storm. Yeah. And, and at some point they're going to find out about it if they haven't already. And they're going to want to try to understand that it's going to impact them. What does that mean? You know, that, you know, on multiple levels. Well, I mean, you know, look, you know, it's to your credit that you can talk about it. Um, it gives you, it gives your voice and your perspective in an, an informed uh, edge, if you will. And I think that's why, you know, whoever you talked to told you, yeah, it's okay for you to talk about this psychologically, emotionally, it helps you because there will come a time when you're not interested in it anymore. It's, you know, it, the, the pain won't be there anymore because you'll have reviewed it so many times. You're like, okay, I get it. You know, maybe it's a dull pain, like a pebble in your shoe, but you won't look at it, go, hey, did I have a role in this? No, you didn't. You were the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time. And, you know, David, it's interesting because you are a writer, so you might appreciate this. I'm um, hired some um, consultants to help me draft the proposal for my book. Yeah. And we were at the retreat, a couple couple day weekend retreat, identifying what's the what's the scope and the arc of of the book and the storyline and the chapters. And at the end of day one, I, I I said, you know, and it's all about thoughtfully fit the leadership model. And at the end of the first day, I looked at the two facilitators and I said, you know, gosh. This model really helped me when when John was arrested. Someday I'm gonna I think I'm gonna write a book about about that. Yeah. And they looked at each other, and they looked at me, and they're like, "Darcy, that is this book." And I said, "No, no, no. This book is about thoughtfully fit the model." And they said, "Yeah, this book like that. It helped you. That story. That's what's going to make this come alive." Now, at that stage, uh, three years ago, I wasn't I wasn't ready that that took a lot of therapy to get to the place like, wow, can I put this out there? Can I write about this? Can I be public? And now where I am, I'm so grateful because it the story doesn't own me anymore. Right. I was hiding. I was like, hope, hope nobody knows or I hope that. And it was an exhausting place to live. Whereas now it's just, this is, this is my life. And, and yeah, this really awful thing happened and I'm still here and I've come through the other side. Yeah, exactly. And too. Yeah. Well, okay. I, let me, I, I need to decompress now. Let me ask you, um, I, I don't want to, is, how are your daughters doing now? Yeah. My, my daughters are, 
incredible. So they are now 15 and well, my second daughter was, is going to be 14 and they still have their therapists that they see and they are in a place of um, healing. They have a relationship with their dad. They visit him while well, pre-COVID visited him in prison, um, talk to him, write letters, mail pictures and um, are Mm. really strong yeah good kids yeah well yeah i think that's that's to your credit because remember you're the one orchestrating it so you need to accept that credit so what do you let me switch gears and get off of this emotional stuff before i start bawling like a baby (laughs) what do you you think yeah i mean i didn't really even want to get into that but anyway what do you think is who do you think is an ideal reader for for your book who do you think is an ideal reader for the book and why yeah the book we wrote the ideal reader in that we wrote with the ideal reader in mind is a is a is a professional successful woman age 35 to 55 who right that that's who we had in mind in writing it and while we've had lots of feedback from women in that genre category of how powerful it is Mm. i'll tell you what i didn't expect david is how how many how many men and executives and um uh People who, I'll, I'll, I'll bottom line, I'd say if, I, if there's one thing that I've, from, from people I've heard who have read and enjoyed the book, it's somebody who wants to be intentional in how they're living their life. And they want some concrete strategies to deal with those six obstacles. Three of them are internal where we get in our own way. Three of them are external where we have challenges with other people. They want to be able to handle themselves thoughtfully and have the strategies and skills and tools to be able to do that. Intention so seems to the be. Book that, uh, sorry, one last piece. I was sure. just going to say this isn't a book that for like the, the the couch potato to try to say you need to do a five k right. If, if we're looking at that metaphor, physically fit. It's not trying to convince anybody, but the person who's saying I want to be more thoughtfully fit th- and they're motivated. That's the person that would enjoy this book. I could see that. And I was going to say that intention seems to be a big component to coaching in general, that getting clear about intention long term. Do you think most people are kind of like stuck on this, you know, wheel where they're just fulfilling short term goals and don't know what long term goals are? or they're free is it that they're afraid to look yes i know it's kind of a silly question no david it's not silly at all it's it's the things that people don't talk about and and it's one of the reasons i love coaching is because clients bring in their most vulnerable thoughts and fears that that they don't talk about elsewhere and so i have this window into the human psyche based on clients coming in that they share. And I'd say there's probably two, two main things. One is people haven't thought about where am I going? What's my vision? Who do I want to be in 10 years? Right. They, they just haven't, they just kind of make decisions day by day by day and get a phone call with, uh, you know, a job offer. And they're like, Oh my God, they want me. I guess I'm going to that job next. The second category or bucket is the person who knows what they want, but they don't know how to get there. They are scared. It's too big of a leap. They have imposter syndrome, all sorts of things that that get in the way of them attaining that goal, whatever it is. Now, can thoughtfully fit that model help with something like writer's block? Is it comparable? to um oh what's that lady's name is it julia i can't remember her first name cameron the artist way i know you've heard of that oh the artist way yeah yeah i can't remember what what her first name is 
I've got two copies in my other room, but I So you do. Okay. So you yeah, I thought that you would be aware of it cuz it's been around for a long time now. What do you think of that? How does that kind of compare to what you do with people with your model? Yeah. Softly fit and in the book we, what, what I'm trying to do is help people to be able to use the skills that I know works in coaching when I'm coaching clients to be able to coach themselves. And when I am coaching individuals or teams, executives, there, there's two parts of the equation that make coaching very powerful. One is the focus on creating new awareness. And then two is with that new awareness, you create intentional actions to move forward. In Thoughtfully Fit, mm, okay. with the core, the three steps I talked about, pause, think, act, that's the way that you can coach yourself. So if you have writer's block, most people go right to action. Or even if they go and they call a friend and say, oh, I have writer's block. And their friend will say, okay, why don't you just write for 10 minutes, you know, a brainstorm? Or why don't you go, you know, ha ha go to happy hour? Why don't you, they've got some kind of recommendation that goes right to action. This model absolutely can help in that situation because what it requires you to do is pause and think. And in the think, it's where you're asking yourself thoughtful questions. What, what, what's happening that I am stuck? When's the last time I had writer's block? What did I do to overcome it then? What do I know about my personality that helps me to get unstuck? And in asking those questions, you create new awareness. Right. With the new yeah. awareness, then you can act, right? Intentionally. Yeah, I actually did do that. I kind of went through that process and I'm I'm still go I'm still going through it. Um but yeah, you have I mean, for for different people it's different. For me, I just had to look at why why is this manifesting? What is it, you know, what are the little demons running around in, in your cabeza there? And why are they there? Yeah. How did they get there? And like what you said, when was the last time this manifested? What did you do? When did this start? You know, do you want to know when it started? Well, it started a long time ago. Okay. And now you're trying to jump back into it right away. No, it doesn't work that way. So absolutely. Um, let me ask you, what advice do you have for people who um, are at a fork in the road type of uh, moment? Like the path less traveled. Mm. So I've had a lot of in the road moments. <laughs> um, and I, I'll say this process, even just the core, these, these simple three steps, the model's much, much more expansive than that. But that right there is an opportunity to help yourself identify, pause and think, okay, here's the fork. Here's the two decisions. Do I take this job or do I take this job? Do I quit and do I resign? Do I retire? Right. Whatever it might be. Do I marry this person or do, who knows what the fork is? Pause and think and ask yourself some thoughtful questions. It may be, okay, I'm going to step into this scenario and play it out 10 years. How do I feel if 10 years from now I chose that road? Now, let me ask then, the other road, how do I feel 10 years and pay attention to your energy and the new awareness you're getting? Go ahead. Well, let me ask you, and I'm sure this question, you've either thought of it or you've heard it when people, when you talk about this model, how long should the pause take? Now, it's a rhetorical question. Okay, because I know what you're going to say, and or at least I think I do but it needs to be asked. So how long do you think that pause should be? Like, um, what was that Tom, that, what do you think? that Tom Hanks movie? Remember where he's at? He, he, he sees the, the roads cast away. I think it was. Oh, uh -huh. Remember the ending very, a lot of symbolism in that, but he's one, which way do I go? What do I do now that I'm here? So, you know, I mean, and you put it back on me, I think, and rightfully so. I mean, it, it could take, it could take years. Obviously, you don't want it to. 
So, I mean, what do you think? Because you're the yeah. expert. <laughs> you're the expert, not me. Well, um, the, if we're looking just at this part of the model, the core, these three steps, pause, think, act, what's ideal is that you don't get stalled out in one of them and that it's like wash, rinse, repeat. So ideally, you wouldn't pause for years. It's critical. So, so, so hit the pause button, get off of autopilot, stop just going through the motions to think, to ask yourself those questions, to create some new awareness, mm. but then you have to act. You have to take the step. Once you acted, once you've done whatever it is that you decide you're going to do, then you can pause again and think, how is this going? What surprised me about this? What did I not expect? And then you can act and make a different choice. So the pause may be, it, it may be a couple seconds just to get yourself off of autopilot. It may be like the case where I, with my crisis communicator, she said, you got to take a couple months off. Yeah. Give yourself the gift of a pause. Yeah. Well, that sounds reasonable. I'm glad you did take a couple months. So I let me do and it was hard. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know what I would have done. Honestly, I probably would have just moved out to a cabin in the woods or something like that. Uh, Nicholas, right. Like that Nicolas Cage movie that I just saw. Um, for those unsure about coaching, can you elaborate or summarize the gist of your thesis as to the impact of it on personal and professional development? If that yes. makes sense the way I worded it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and the, the, the thesis at that time, and this was, oh my gosh, 2004, I think, um, I looked at it through the lens of the impact on overall life satisfaction. Um, and the, the, the results were coaching increases your life satisfaction, regardless of what your starting point is, regardless of what obstacles, what crises come your way. When you hit the pause button to be in a reflective conversation with a coach to think, and that's the benefit when you said, if somebody's at a crossroads, what can you do? You can coach yourself or you can hire a coach. I almost always have a coach because the coach helps ask me questions to create and help me create new awareness instead of me spiraling and getting stuck, right? Um, and so that process of having a coach to help you create that new awareness and then not get stuck. So, so not get stuck in the, the, the analysis paralysis and cycling and thinking and thinking and thinking, and then saying at the end of every coaching session, say, okay, what, what are your action items for the next two weeks? What are you going to do mm -hmm. as a result of the new awareness you have right now? That is, that moves people forward. And I will, I can't tell you how many times I will have a client say, Darcy, after four months of coaching, Darcy, I, I've been trying to, to get unstuck for four years. How, how did I do this in four months? Well, it's because you are doing the work of creating new awareness. And then you're just saying, what's just the next step for two weeks? Not the next step in two years. I want to quit my job. It's like in two weeks. Um, I'm just going to polish my resume. That's what I'm going to do in this two week period. Or I'm going to just write down all of the careers that I am intrigued with, whatever. And those baby steps, just like if you're training for a marathon, you don't start on day run and, and run 20 miles. You go buy a pair of running shoes and you jog four blocks and walk home. So it's that consistency in the training that helps. Look, and that's what my thesis showed. So as a first step, let's, I mean, I, I know you've heard this statistic, something like 95 or more than that, 95, 99 or something percent of new, of all new businesses will be long gone within their first couple of years. And the further you go out, the greater that statistic is. And I remember we used to hear that all the time at the Small Business Administration, when you're working with a business owner. What I want to ask you is, why do you think that is? And if the business owner, let's 
business owner A, you know, generic business owner just calls you up and says, oh, Darcy, I, I don't know what to do. I have all these problems. My business isn't performing and everything. What would be the first step? So it's kind of like a two-part question, if that's all right. Uh, yes, powerful. Both questions are powerful. Um, so the research, uh, you're asking, I think, my opinion on why most businesses fail. It, it, because it's hard to be an entrepreneur. It's hard to be a small business owner. It, it's a lot harder than showing up and clocking in at nine o'clock and leaving at five. You need to, as you know, I mean, this is your life's profession and, and your expertise. You need to figure out how do you market and how do you connect and how do you sell and and and, and creating your your CRM systems and and then getting to this place where a lot of the clients that I work with who are entrepreneurs get overwhelmed and they're trying to figure out then at what point do I hire people, but I'm not making enough money to hire somebody. And so I have to do it myself and I'm in the weeds doing all this stuff myself. So I can't be doing the stuff that I love. I mean, it's, it's no wonder so many businesses fail. Yeah. So what I do first step, if somebody business owner uh, came to me and, and many times they do, and they come to me, the first thing we would do is get uh, take a look at what's the vision that you're trying to create. Are you are you building an empire? Are you is this a hobby? Job? What is it that you're trying to create? And then what are the obstacles that are getting in the way of creating that? So we're just going to take a look at desired future state and current state, and what are the what are the obstacles and what are the, what are the gaps? So if you're physically fit, or I'm sorry. If you're thoughtfully fit, what does that look like as opposed to physically fit? We know what that looks like. You have your six pack or your eight pack or whatever. If you're thoughtfully fit, how does that manifest? Mm -hmm. Is that nirvana? Is that, um, hey, I'm just living a life that I'm comfortable? Mm. What, what does that look like? So two things I want to, I want to, such a great question, David. I love your. No, oh, you're being kind. It's a. <laughs> One is it is about being intentional, being thoughtful about how you're moving through life, right? That's sort of that 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 meta view. But I want to give you a really specific example of how thoughtfully fit plays out when when somebody really is training and practicing to be thoughtfully fit. Something happens. Things happen. You you get an email. Your you know neighbor calls you and says yells at you. You're in a board meeting. Whatever. Something happens, and you immediately have a first thought. It's our humanity. Our first thoughts lead to our actions. Right, our thoughts lead to our actions. So, you, if, if if you hang up on this uh, podcast interview and you check your email and you have a snide email from a, a, a former client that's attacking you, and your first thought is "What a jerk," and you act on that, you're gonna right pound back some defensive reply. And yeah, I, I would have done that. I would have done that. Now I deleted, but I'm sorry to interrupt you. And so when you're thoughtfully fit, it's not that you don't have your first thought. Of course, we're human. Something happens, you're angry, right? You're, you're, you're defensive. You slow it down and pause to think, is this thought serving me or sabotaging me? If this thought is sabotaging me, what a jerk. Don't act on that. Because if you do, it's going to lead to a sabotaging action and sabotaging results. Slow it down. Give yourself permission to, to say what a jerk and to have your pity party and whatever it might be. But then you need to, when you're thoughtfully fit, think, how do I want to move forward? And what are some thoughts that will serve me instead? And following that, can you get to a point, I shouldn't say can you, but through the model, can you find a place where a i know my true nature i know what my inner passion is and then three how to nurture that mm -hmm. because I, yes. I i i want to get there i think those are important points would that help you yes 
and 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 the, the, the more self-awareness you have, the, the the more intentional and thoughtful you can be. So so we talked earlier, and I don't know if it was on the interview or before we got on the interview. Sure. Um, so my apologies to your listeners, but we were talking about how conflict is hard. For Absolutely. Life, yeah. Right. So if you know your default is conflict is hard and I retreat, I hide, I stonewall. Someone else, conflict is hard. They might be a high D on the disc profile. They're a bully. There's conflict. They're going all in. Whatever, if you have awareness of what your default is, you then can get off of autopilot. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm triggered. I'm angry and I want to yell. Ooh, that hasn't served me in the past. That sabotaging thought, what a jerk doesn't end well. I, I know. <laughs> I know how that story ends. I'm going to pause and I'm going to just journal. I'm going to go for a bike ride. I'm going to vent to my spouse, whatever it might be, so that I can then get to a place where I'm consciously choosing how I want to act instead of just acting on, on, on autopilot. I, I went a direction with your question that you might not have intended. So let me just pause and see if you wanted me to go a different, a different place. No, I mean, Basically, my question was, if I continue along the thoughtfully fit model, will it eventually help me get to the point where I can, as a hypothetical reader, will it uh, at some point help me learn what my true nature is? And then from that, my, and you know, what's, what am I really doing here? What is my true inner passion? Am I in line with that? And then learn how to nurture that. Because to me, those are important questions on the journey of trying to mature as an, you know, as a, as, a, as a person who wants to be fulfilled. So would that help me to get to those points? Yes, 100%. Not the least of which is because as if, if you are really training and practicing being thoughtfully fit, you are aware of those defaults and those patterns. So for instance, I spent 15, 20 years in politics I didn't have the courage to say no when I got the call from the senator. Hey, would you come and run my office? Uh, oh, he wants me to run his office. I guess I, I, that's what I should do. I, I just was on this path of least resistance. When you're thoughtfully fit, you pause and think, gosh, that's flattering. Gosh, that's such a nice offer. Thank you so much. And actually, that's not where my passion lies. I want to do this instead. Right. Does that align with my other interests or, or, or general goal in marketing what they call your authentic voice. Yes. So in coaching somebody, how important is context? Being in the right environment where your nature is being cultivated, for example. Um, say more so that I can really understand the question. And it could be my fault because it could be that the, the question is just too broad or too vague. Um, so how important is context in coaching? So, for example, you know, if, if I'm at a point where I'm financially unstable um, and the future is unpredictable, would you coach me differently than if my environment uh, the environmental factors were different. I was more financially sound. The mm. the future was more certain. Would you coach me differently? You might be surprised at my answer. I don't know. I'll find out. No. Okay. I would not coach you differently. And the reason is context. So in coaching, there's not a le there's not a lot of need for story. So when I'm coach, if I'm coaching you. I don't need all the story. And then he said this and I, and she said that, and my bank account says, my wife thinks that because if I'm, if I'm a consultant, if I'm a mentor, I need all those details because I need to diagnose the problem so that I can spit out and give you advice on what I think you should do with coaching. I'm not giving you advice on what I think you should do. I have no idea what you should do. I don't know if you're at a stage where you want more freedom and and to practice, you know, more mindfulness and Buddhism, or if you're at a place where you want to create the most powerful company in the world. I have no idea. So what I'm doing, instead of asking questions for my own curiosity's sake, I'm asking questions that are helping you create new awareness so that you can move forward in whatever way you want. 
doesn't matter what the context is. It matters what are you wanting in your life and what's getting in the way of that. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does because the contexts vary and they and they can change fairly rapidly. So let me ask you, I only got a few more questions left for you. What is the one thing you wish you had known when you began your career as a coach? My career as a coach? Yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had known the difference. I thought when I began as a coach that my job was to solve problems, to fix people's troubles, to give advice. And it took me a long time to have the confidence to recognize that that's not the greatest and highest value that I can provide as a coach. I wish I, I wish I had known that and that it didn't take me so long to, to figure that out. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. You, you can't fix people. All you can do is offer, constructive input and maybe maybe that i don't know is maybe try to point them in the right direction and and that's where i'll i'll, I'll share with you with uh, if, if i can maybe you shouldn't um yeah that then in coaching like i'm not pointing you in any direction because i don't know what direction you want to go i'm helping you figure out right where what what's the end goal and do, do you, you want, want to, to do you really want to care or is it more important to be objective? Uh, say more. Well, I mean, as far as pointing them in the right direction, I mean, yeah, you want to care, but do you really I want to deeply? I care deeply about my clients, but the reason I'm not pointing them in the right direction is because then it's my agenda. It's my values. It's my beliefs. It's my right. goals. It's my dreams. It's, and that's not coaching. It's through the lens of that personal bias or predilection. So, and that's, yeah. So, I mean, you can show them the road, but you can't make them walk it. You can put the lantern on at the end of the road so that they see it there, but they have to decide, do I want to walk toward that light? Right. And, and I'm not even going to like try to convince them to go down a road. I'm, I'm going to say, so, what are the possible roads? And, and because when I'm coaching somebody, they are the expert in their own life. And so they know that what the potential roads are. You would hope. <laughs> and if they don't know, that's what's powerful about coaching is through that line of questioning that I would say, so what are the potential roads? I don't know. I could do what my dad did. I could play it safe. Okay. Yeah. So those are a couple of roads. What else? Oh, uh, I don't know. What what would your like ideal retired future self have to say about a potential road? Oh, oh, uh, right. And all of a sudden you can feel an energy shift. Right. They and never so, looked at know. it from that perspective. So they right. go from being a hot mess to tidying up a little bit. Yeah. And just like you said, beautifully exploring different perspectives. And so I might um, say, hey, I've got an idea. What's the um, what's the uh, non COVID perspective? I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just making this up. That's a bad example. But I might throw something out there that they'll say, oh, gosh, oh, I don't know. But I, but you know what that just sparked for me, Darcy, and all of a sudden they're off and running. People are really smart. And most of the time in, in, in our relationships, whether it's with a friend, a roommate, a spouse, a, a parent, people have opinions on what we should do. Right. Coaching does not bring an opinion on what you should do. Coaching creates the space for you to identify what you want to do. Right. So in other words, it's the catalyst. So what are some of the best resources that have helped you? uh learn about coaching but also be capable you know and 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 um effective in coaching hmm. I, I would say the number one resource for me is having my own coach i mean that's where i fast track i i read a lot self-help leadership team building books i listen to podcasts i study I oh uh, we got to talk books after we're done with this podcast then okay i've got a couple of books i want to ask you about oh fan, I, would, I would love that 
Okay, I'll write these down right now. So people listening or watching this won't, I guess you'll have to go through the paywall or whatever they say here. Um, okay, I'm going to make some notes because I want to ask you about two or three books here and, and, and um, some other things in particular, but go right ahead. Yeah, I, I would love that. And, and so, you know, conferences, webinars, you, you name it, all of that has been helpful on my journey. But what fast tracks for me, what has fast tracked it, fast tracked my journey to getting to this place of doing what I love is having my own coach who is asking me the tough questions of what do I want? What's getting in the way? What would help? You know, not the least of which when the senator I was working for for 12 years announced he was retiring, myself, my colleagues, my family, everybody assumed I'd stay in politics. I hired a coach and she asked me one question that changed forever the trajectory of my life. She said, Darcy, if, if, if you now in 10 years looked back and made if the decision you made now, 10 years, you had no regrets, what would you do? Oh my God. Well, I wouldn't stay in politics. I couldn't believe how quickly that answer came to me when every other conversation I was having was around staying in politics. Yeah. Yeah. It, it sheds the light on an area that wasn't lit before. Well, let me just um, tie things up because we're having so much fun talking here. For listeners or watchers who want to learn more about your coaching and would like to reach out to you, how can they learn more and find out if they would be a good fit for you? Oh, thank you. So my website is DarcyLoma.com, and that has all of the services. I do keynotes and team retreats and coaching. Everything is uh, that our company does is around creating high-performing people and teams, and we solve people problems. If they want to know more about the book and about Thoughtfully Fit, um, if they can go to ThoughtfullyFit.com. And on ThoughtfullyFit.com, there is a, a free quiz they can take. If they're curious, what's the biggest hurdle? So I said that there's six hurdles that every client comes to me, six obstacles. If they want to know what is my biggest hurdle, they can take that quiz and it will spit out the Thoughtfully Fit practice where they have the biggest challenge and then some strategies on how, how do you start training to overcome that challenge. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Uh, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to talk with me. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, please stick around for a couple minutes. I would love that. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate your curiosity and um, interest in the model and, and just the level of compassion you have in your interviewing. It's wonderful. Thank you. Well, you're more than welcome. Just uh, take care for anybody listening or watching. Thank you so much for tuning in and take care. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And thank you again. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.